Hey, welcome to this edition of Snowmobiler Television. On this show, we're going to be throwing a little bit of love at the old SRX here, and Tyler Swarm is also going to be talking to us about the new Polaris Boost. I think he's a fan. Then in Afterburn, we're going to slow things down a little bit when I review the new Transporter Light Series from Yamaha. So let's get at it. STV is brought to you by Yamaha revs your heart. Polaris, think outside. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of pickup trucks for 56 years. Tough, smart, capable. I've had this SRX in my fleet for the past couple of years, but it really doesn't see a lot of attention, especially since the SCSI joined the group. Now, the other reason it doesn't see a lot of attention is that I've already done a bunch of work to it a few seasons ago with some maintenance items, and since then, it really hasn't broken. It's one of the best running triples I have. <laughs> Four mile an hour. We go, go. We go, go. On the ice, the SRX barely managed to pull speeds in the mid 90 mile an hour range, which was pretty disappointing. I thought this thing would at least see 100 miles an hour. Then the SCSI, the sled that never fails to fail, sucked up the rest of the limelight for the season as the SRX just kept doing its thing. But now, Brody and I think it's time to put a little effort into the old sled, and we're going to change the piston rings today. Hey, look, you got the right tool for taking the springs off. That's a you job. Don't lose any. Mind you, just the piston rings this time. In an earlier show this season, the spoiled sibling in this group, the SCSI, got the full treatment with a new set of Wiseco slugs. The SRX is only getting the rings. Now, I am taking a bit of a chance that the pistons, that if they're original, have over 18,000 kilometers on them, are still good and haven't scored the cylinders too much. Now, I won't know that until I'm inside. Instead, I wanted to do just the rings on this machine to show that you can freshen up an engine on a bit more of a budget. As always, I'm starting this job off with a quick compression test on all three cylinders to get a picture of where the engine is at. Now there's some debate online as to what we should be seeing for a compression test on the old SRX. Really, I've seen numbers anywhere between 130 and 150 PSI is acceptable, but things like altitude can have an effect on that, or if you put a little bit of oil down the cylinders to cheat it a bit. Really though, what I am looking for is consistency across the cylinders. In the case here, we've got 130 on the mag side and 135 on the two other cylinders, so a 5 PSI spread. That's not too bad. Actually, better than I thought it was going to be. Getting into a job like this isn't always a predictable procedure, but there's some things you'll need to do before you dig in, like order your parts. The most obvious thing to get is a replacement set of rings that are the correct bore size. I'm assuming there's stock on this SRX, but on any older sled like this one, there's always the chance that a previous owner did some cylinder repair work and went with an overbore that would require a larger replacement ring set. Then you'll also need new gaskets to replace the ones you'll be ruining by taking the engine apart. Now I chose to go with a full set I sourced at Kimpex. This kit even comes with new power valve gaskets, which will allow Brody to clean those things up while we're at it. So this Yamaha tip is also a teachable moment and the teachable moment is all about naming your snowmobiles cylinders and they're not Tom, Dick and Harry. So basically whenever somebody's referring to the engine cylinder of a snowmobile, it's either the PTO, middle or mag side cylinders. Now do you know what PTO stands for? No, I do not. So PTO is power takeoff. That's always the side that your power is coming from. So it's the clutch side. Then you've got your middle cylinder and then your mag side cylinder, which is the side your ignition's on. So the magneto's in there. Now, if you have a twin, which cylinder is not there? The middle. Middle, that's pretty obvious. So you just have PTO and mag side. So now you know. Yes, I know now. You know now. <laughs> 
continuing the teardown, I'm taking my time checking for any other problems along the way and also paying attention to any different fasteners as they're removed. Sometimes there'll be different links for different locations on either the heads or the bolts holding the jugs to the block. If you find bolts of different lengths, mark them or make a mental note to make sure they go back in the right place for reassembly. So at this point, we got some good news and some bad news. The good news is these are standard bore 69 millimeter pistons, which means the standard bore replacement rings that I've got are gonna work here. The bad news is one of the exhaust valve cables was broken, which definitely would have killed some of the top end on the SRX, but it also means I gotta find one before it's gonna be running again. Next part in this rebuild though, is to clean everything up, replace the rings on these old pistons, and then start reassembly. We were planning to clean up the power valves on the 700 anyways, but this broken cable will be an issue. And it's been broken for some time by the looks of the guillotine that I had to pull out of the cylinder with a pair of pliers and was a real bear to clean up. Now, unexpected issues like this are always possible and we'll push back the finish of this job while we're waiting for a new cable to arrive. At least it's a part on the outside of the engine so we can continue with the cleanup of the parts and reassembly. Another tip for whenever you've got an engine open like this is to prevent anything from falling down into the bottom end by tucking some paper towel in there. Then if you're worried about dirt and debris that has fallen on top of the paper towel, use a vacuum for when you take them out. Keeping the inside of the engine clean is super important. So at this point, we've got everything cleaned up, the old pistons are exposed, the old rings are off, and we're ready for reassembly. But I do have to say, for a sled with over 18,000 kilometers on it, I'm pretty impressed with the conditions of the pistons and cylinders, so I am comfortable just installing the new rings. Besides, I wanted to show that this job could be done on a little bit more of a budget, so we're not putting new pistons in. However, if I cared a little bit more, I probably would opt for new pistons in this case. But that would add about $100 per cylinder, almost doubling the cost for this job. Another cost I'm avoiding is rebuilding the cylinders with a new Nicosil coating or buying replacements altogether. Now, Nicosil is the hard coating on the inside wall of the cylinders. It's very thin and super hard for a long wearing surface. Now, the inside of these cylinders don't have any deep scratches, which is good, but they're polished pretty good from the wear. Almost all of the crosshatch pattern is worn off. And because the hatch is worn off, the next thing I'm gonna do is super controversial. Online, I cannot find the answer as to whether or not you can or can't or even should hone a Nicosil cylinder, but I'm gonna do it anyways. The cross hatch is the crisscross scratch pattern in the cylinders that helps hold lubricating oil for the rings, but it's also there to help seat in the new rings which we're installing. So if there isn't any hatch left because it's been worn off, the new rings will most likely glaze and not seat properly, giving up any gains you might have had by installing the new rings in the first place. That's why I'm taking the chance with a very light hone job. To do this job absolutely properly, the jug should be brought to an engine machine shop where they have very expensive automated equipment to cut the new crosshatch. Now, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just using this cheap three finger hone to clean things up. It's not just good, it's good enough. Now you can also use Scotch-Brite pads and soap and water to clean up the cylinders or to remove a little bit of aluminum transfer. If you got a lot of aluminum transfer from squeaking a piston, well, you might wanna go at things with muriatic acid, but be real careful with that stuff. It is nasty, 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 and will eat through your skin if given half the chance. Now, when it comes to honing, never ever use a ball hone on a two-cycle cylinder. The balls will get caught in the transfer ports and do damage. Ball hones are for four-cycle cylinders only. With the cylinders all cleaned up, it's time to install the new rings on the old pistons. You do want to make sure that the new rings fit well in the ring lands and move around freely. The cylinders are next. Just make sure to lube everything up with some two-cycle oil and make sure that the ring end gaps line up with the anti-rotation pins in the ring groove as you carefully slide the jugs back on. So over the last few minutes, I didn't go through each and every detail it's gonna to take to change the piston rings in your sled. That would take way more time than I've got. Instead, I wanted to hit some of the high points, plus give you some tips that might give you the confidence to tackle a job like this yourself because it's really not that hard. Plus, it can be a lot of fun when you've got somebody in the shop helping you, like I've had Brody here today. And we're not quite done with the old SRX here. We're still waiting on parts for those exhaust valves for that new cable, but we're getting really close. 
So, Broad, what do you think? Uh, is this sled gonna have 100 miles an hour in it now? Well, as long as it's faster than the SCSI, then I don't care. Faster than the SCSI. It probably will be faster than the SCSI because that sled never fails to fail. This segment is brought to you by Ford. Most of the time on Afterburn, we're talking more about the performance side of snowmobiling. This time though, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and feature a different branch of the snowmobile marketing tree and talk about the Transporter Light Series in this burn. Yamaha bestowed on this sled the Transporter name, and it can be found under the utility banner on their corporate website alongside other sleds in this category like the VK540, VK Professional, and Transporter 800. But in my opinion, the Transporter Lite is much more than simply just a utility sled. To understand this model, you have to understand the whole category of these 400cc mid-sized snowmobiles. This class has been with us for a couple of years and was created to fill a void between kitty sleds and full-size adult models offered new by manufacturers. And yes, this was a class created by the relationship between Yamaha and Articat, meaning each of these manufacturers has their own version of these sleds. This class started with one-up Yamaha Venoms and Articat Blast models, which are both an absolute blast to ride, pardon the obvious pun. From there, each manufacturer offers mountain versions that are legit rides outfitted with longer tracks, taller lugs, and monobeam rear suspensions. Then there's the utility versions, again with longer tracks and racks to load your gear on or transport whatever you need. This class continues to develop for 2022 and there's now dedicated two-up models available as well. Now, these two-up sleds wouldn't be there if there wasn't the desire in the marketplace, which there obviously is. I mean, just go try and buy one, I dare you. All of the sleds in this category are selling like hotcakes. Now, speaking of selling, if you've researched this line, you've probably noticed that the prices are not necessarily, well, how do I put this, uh, cheap. And I've had a number of conversations with other sledders out there who've commented about the expensive price tag, so I wanted to touch on that. First off, this is a new snowmobile sold with the latest technology and with a warranty. So if you're comparing the price of a new transporter with the price of, say, a 40-year-old Bravo, that's not necessarily a fair comparison to make. Even though the Bravo is an excellent old sled and has become very desirable, its performance doesn't hold a candle to this new 400 class sled, especially when compared to the utility factor of the transporter lights. To begin with, the seating position and overall feel of these mid-sized machines make the snowmobiling experience much more enjoyable for smaller or novice riders, but they still provide a bunch of fun for riders like me. These sleds feel light and nimble and are fast enough to break any speed limit on any trail I know of. Now, I could spend a whole day on these sleds when the pace is a little bit more leisurely and never feel I'm missing out on any part of the fun of snowmobiling. In the Yamaha Transporter Light Series, there are two sleds that can do this. One is geared a little bit more towards work. The other is geared a little bit more towards family fun, and it's the Yamaha Transporter Light 2-Up. The first Transporter Light has a stretched out chassis allowing for a 146 inch Cobra track to hook up the 400cc engine to the snow. It's a traditional two rail suspension with 1.6 inch lugs that has been equipped with one very high end feature, the flip up rear. This articulated portion allows the track to do a better job at staying on top of the snow when reversing or trying to back up over small obstacles. This flip up system also makes the sled feel a little shorter because even though there's a spring holding it down into the snow, the pressure there is not as much as a regular straight rail would be, so it acts a little bit more like a short track. But this system is also able to lock solid for when you need maximum flotation and grip. I really like this feature. For a sled that's designed to move around effectively off trail and in deep snow, it's an absolute key. The two-up Transporter Lite version shares all the same architecture as the more utility version, right down to the ice blue and frost silver livery. The obvious difference is the two-up seat. What's not so obvious is that the rear suspension does not have the articulated rear section. In this case, on a sled designed to carry two people and maybe do a little less work, I feel this more traditional rail suspension is appropriate. 
But what the suspension does provide is overload springs that can be snapped in place for heavier loads, which reduces bottoming out and maintains the balance of the sled. The other major, not so major difference is the ski stance on the 2-Up, which is 2 inches wider at 40 inches wide compared to the 38-inch stance of the 1-Up. In other ways, these two sleds are similar is that both come standard with electric start and reverse. They both have 397cc two-stroke oil-injected engines with electronic fuel injection, deep snow mountain skis on the front for better flotation, and boast 12 and a half inches of travel for the rear suspension and 7.2 inches out front, all controlled by hydraulic twin tube shocks. The other thing that both the Transporter Lite and Transporter Lite 2-Up sleds have in common is an 11.7 gallon or 44 liter fuel tank, which is a good thing because when you get either one of these sleds on the snow, you're not gonna wanna stop. I mentioned off the top that comparing these sleds to an old Yamaha Bravo isn't exactly fair, but just like those old Bravos, I believe this class of sled is going to become the foundation memory to a lot of future snowmobilers, which is going to ensure that this lifestyle is going to be around for a long time to come. And to that I say, bravo Yamaha. This segment is brought to you by WeatherTech. For the first time in snowmobile history, there's a turbocharged sled coming out of each one of the manufacturers for model year 2022. Now, last to the party, but definitely not least, is Polaris with their Patriot Boost engine. Now, for now, it's only available in the mountain sleds. Let's hope that changes. But to tell you about it in the mountain chassis is our mountain goat, Tyler Swarm. First impression of the new Turbo Chaos. Uh, it instantly made my Axis feel like a dinosaur, pretty much. It was uh, basically an all new sled. Obviously we've got tons of boost on this thing, so that's the exciting part of this new snowmobile, but what's exciting to me as well is the platform. There's been a lot of changes and uh, this sled is completely new altogether. It's, it's really exciting. They've been specifically building the 850 just for this turbo to come out. So they put a lot of time and a lot of effort into this machine. And <clears throat> it feels crisp, it feels powerful. And uh, when you're riding through technical terrain, you know, uh, broken up hillsides and whatnot, you need a lot of track speed and you need it right now. So having that boost is pretty crucial to make it to the next level, that's for sure. An intermediate to more advanced rider is going to benefit from the turbo. Uh, the reason why I say that is the beginner rider, um, if you're pointing this thing uphill and you don't have any momentum, there's a good chance that it's going to build up a lot of boost and flip over. And it's nothing dangerous or anything, um, but it's just something the more beginner rider is going to have to get used to as far as riding with more momentum. And it's nothing impossible. I think any type of rider is going to feel comfortable on it due to the smooth power delivery. So I think it helps every rider really uh, having more speed in the deep snow that keeps you afloat and keeps you from getting stuck. So a few things I like about this machine uh, are the plastics and the rider position of this sled. So you're about two or three inches farther forward on the machine. The plastics are even narrower and tighter and uh, push forward more. Uh, so you have a lot of rider room when you're moving around the sled and you actually stay in a neutral position more than wrong foot forward nowadays. Uh, another great feature a lot of guys have been complaining about sleds now is storage. Uh, having this huge touch screen, uh, obviously the display is amazing, but you open it up and you can fit like two, three pair of goggles, some gloves, maybe a sandwich, keep it warm in there. And uh, that's pretty huge for me because you need to put stuff somewhere. and. Uh, yeah, if you take a look at the back of the sled, we've got a shortened tunnel with a taper at the rear, so it makes all those cool bow tie maneuvers, re-entries, even powder turns so much easier, and it just, it'll spin a circle right in its own track. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of little features on this sled that I, I, I don't know how they're going to make it better. They've got this thing dialed. I don't, I don't know what you would do to it aftermarket-wise, you know. Um, you just basically have to put fuel and oil in it and go ride the thing and uh, 
try not to grin too much because it's so stinking fun. <laughs> So I rode this and then I rode the Skidoo and it instantly felt like way more power than the Skidoo. Um, I love Skidoos, I'm not bashing on them by any means, great sled, but this thing is pulling like twice the amount of boost and it, it's already an, a hard to beat mountain sled and uh, they just made it even harder to beat. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. This tip comes from a conversation that I had with a rider a couple of years ago who really wasn't all that familiar with his machine. He was asking me if there was something broken in his rear suspension because there seemed to be something flopping around in there, so it must be broken. Well, he was wrong. He was referring to the overload springs that are in here, and they're meant to flop around, by the way. Now, if you know what an overload spring is and you know how they work, well, go get a coffee. This tip's not for you. But if you don't, this is an overload spring and it's there to increase the load carrying capacity of your sled for those times where you've got a passenger on the back or maybe you're just hauling a lot of extra gear and you want a little bit more resistance to bottoming out. And they work really easy. Just use your spark plug removal tool onto this cam here, turn it over and snap it into place like that. By the way, there's one on each rail. Now you've got that extra load carrying capacity that you need. Now, when that load goes away, all you gotta do is use that same tool back the cam off and you're back to normal. Hey, thanks for tuning in this week to Snowmobiler Television. Until next time, ride safe. Closed captioning is brought to you by Royal Distributing. STV has been brought to you by CKX, where your passion. Schaefer's, specialized lubricants since 1839. Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Ready to get away? 